this afternoon will be something that's not very well known in the province of Ontario, but it's basically one of uh, the province's greatest natural disasters. It's known as the Great Storm in 1913. And one of the greatest descriptions of the Great Lakes comes from Herman Melville's Moby Dick. He graphically described the Great Lakes as swept by Borean storms and dismasting blasts as direful as any that lashed the salted wave. They know what shipwrecks are, for out of the sight of land, however inland, they have drowned full many a midnight ship with all its shrieking crew. That was a chilling description written in 1851 that foreshadowed the great storm of 1913. And without the doubt, the great storm November 7th to 10th, 1913, was the most violent storm ever recorded on the lakes. Its deadly violence is forever etched in Great Lakes lore. Now the storm itself was actually two storms, which collided over the Great Lakes, creating cyclonic winds and blizzard conditions. Navigation was made nearly impossible for even the most seasoned crews. Many seamen would recall gale force winds blowing from one direction, while 30 to 35 foot waves battered their vessels from the opposite direction. By the time the storm hit Lake Huron on Sunday, November 9th, it had already claimed at least 53 lives and several vessels on Lake Superior and Michigan. But it's on Lake Huron that the full fury of the storm was vented as eight ships were lost with all hands and another 30 hulls were badly damaged with somewhere between 178 and 200 lives lost on Lake Huron alone. It was the most terrible day in Lake Huron's history. And it's the tragedy of November 9th, 1913 on Lake Huron and its aftermath, which will be the focus of the next few minutes. Late on the evening of November 8th, four vessels, four vessels, the James C. Carruthers, which you see here, the J.H. Sheetal, the Hydrus, and the Wexford, who after bucking the winds, snow, and waves of Lake Superior, gambled and made the fateful decision to venture onto Lake Huron. And it's here important to remember that the story of the great storm is more than a natural disaster. It's a very human story where human decisions led to fatal consequences. The captains of all four vessels were competent seamen entrusted with grave responsibilities. They were also mindful of the ship owners' needs to make profits by carrying heavy cargoes in as many voyages as possible. A skillful captain was highly prized amongst ship owners and crew. They were expected to have enough confidence in their ship, crew, and their own judgment that they would not be frightened by every storm warning. So it was no surprise when ship's captains ignored clearly posted storm warning signals issued by the U.S. Weather Bureau. Indeed, a representative of the Carruthers owners later told a newspaper that no master ever paid attention to the weather reports. If they had, they would never have gotten anywhere. And there was reason to believe that the worst of the storm was over. Winds seemed to be calming down on Sunday morning, and barometric pressure was rising. However, seasoned mariners call this lull a sucker hole, created when the storm's cyclonic winds shifted direction. The counterclockwise rotation of the hurricane meant that its high winds were just shifting direction from northeast to northwest. Even after the loss of the RMS Titanic the year before, Little heed was paid by mariners to the weather warnings. On November 9th, this, some say, reckless attitude doomed hundreds of seamen. The first of the four ships to enter the lake was the James C. Carruthers. She was the pride of the Canadian fleet. And there are parallels between the Titanic and the Carruthers. Built in Collingwood Shipyard, she was launched in May 1913. Carruthers was the newest ship on the Great Lakes. And at 529 feet, she was also the largest. Her captain, William Wright, was a 25-year lake veteran. Easily recognized by his flaming red mustache, Captain Wright was beloved and respected by his crew. The Carruthers was just on her third voyage. Captain Wright told a fellow skipper that we still to learn all her tricks, and the lads are complaining that the paint in their rooms is still sticky. Before they locked down in the Sioux Canal on November 8th, Captain Wright consulted fellow Captain S.A. Lyons of the J-8 Sheetal. And that's the Sheetal there. Together, they decided to brave Lake Huron's waters despite the storm warnings. Later, Captain Wright's decision to continue was severely criticized, but it's important to remember 
that Wright made the same decision to carry on that many other skippers made that day. Besides, Captain Wright was in command of the most modern ship on the lakes built to weather, any gale. And as the only survivor of the four ships that entered into Lake Huron from the Sioux, Sheedle's Captain Lyon's perspective is informative. He reported seeing the Carruthers navigational lights fade away into the distance between snow squalls as she struggled against raging 55 to 75 mile per hour winds and turbulent waters. Captain Lyon's observation was the last sighting of the Carruthers. Robert Hemming, in his book, Ships Gone Missing, believes that the Carruthers must have been broadsided in a trough by a towering wave as she made the critical turn in the Georgian Bay. Some argued that the Carruthers was too heavily laden with wheat and foundered when she was swamped by waves when her cargo hatches gave way. In any case, the last terrifying hours on board the Carruthers remain a mystery. The Carruthers is the last of the vessels lo uh, lost on Lake Huron during the great storm that have yet to be found. Uh, second, uh, the second last one, the Hydrus, was found, as some of you, if you've, if, if you've been watching the news or uh, there's a National Geographic coming up, the Hydrus was just found about 12 miles off Point O'Bark, Michigan, last June or July. The Hydrus followed just 15 miles behind the Sheetle. Captain Lyons may have seen the Carruthers lights to the blizzard, but he knew nothing of the Hydrus behind him. The Hydrus and her sister ship Argus was built in record time in Cleveland in 1903. In a tragic coincidence, the Argus was upbound on Lake Huron, that's heading north, on November 9th, while her sister ship was heading south. They would both share the same fate. Hydra's captain, John Lowe, was already two days behind schedule when he locked down at the Sioux. He was returning to Cleveland with a load of iron ore and a crew of 24. In northern Lake Huron, Captain James Watts, master of the upbound freighter J.F. Durston, exchanged blistle blasts with the Hydrus when it entered into Lake Huron. It was the Hydrus's final salute as she was never seen again. A few miles to the south of the Hydrus, the Argus battled the same storm. Captain Walter Eiler of the light-loaded George C. Crawford witnessed the Argus's last moments through the rolling peaks and valleys of water. He was seized with what he called a numbing horror as the Argus got caught in a deep trough and crumbled, as he described it, like an eggshell and disappeared beneath the waves. And he would later say that after the crew in the uh, wheelhouse saw it, there is complete silence for the rest of the journey. They were trying to absorb the horror they had just seen. A similar fate may have befell the Hydrus. Both vessels were lost with all hands. We can only speculate on the terror of the last hours of Hydrus's death struggle, but once again, it's Captain Lyons of the Sheetle as the only surviving vessel of the little flotilla that is the most unique account of the storm in Lake Huron. Lyons described his own crew's life and death struggle, trying to keep her fire room and engines from being overwhelmed by giant rolling waves washing over her fantail. Over her fantail. The Sheetle was barely able to survive by running ahead of the waves, threatening to flutter from astern. As incredible as Sheetle's survival was, it was the schooner Cephe that has earned the title of miracle survivor of the great storm. Cephe was one of the last commercial schooners on the, on the lakes under the command of Captain Holleran Huey McKinnon. The Cephe was launched in Goderidge at the Marlton Shipyard in 1889. She had always been considered a lucky boat, and at least one song was written about her. On November 9th, Cephe was carrying a load of lumber to Port Huron. For Captain M McKinnon, an experienced seaman, the rapidly falling barometer, rising lake swells, and stiffening winds was all the warning that he needed. Hollering Huey's great lungs roared the appropriate commands for the five man and one woman crew to prepare to weather the storm. As the storm approached, Captain McKinnon ordered the crew aloft to reef in the topsails and lower the mainmast. He headed the Safi to the lee of Cape Smith on the far eastern tip of Manitoulin Island to avoid the worst of the strong gale. Finding his wooden hauled craft rocking violently, Captain McKinnon dragged the anchor, his anchor and let out the chains to steady the ship. It is not known how many hours the crew struggled to keep the Safi afloat, but before it could be dashed to pieces against Manitoulin's rocky shore, Captain McKinnon deliberately scuttled her near 
by the nearby shore. The crew abandoned ship and headed to the beach in a lifeboat. Ojibwa natives sheltered them until the storm passed. Afterwards, Captain McKinnon refloated the Safi and in tattered sails, to the astonishment of all, days late, she sailed into Port Huron under her own sail. The last ship in, the fateful, in that fateful convoy was the Wexford under Frank Bruce Cameron. She was the last to lock down through the Sioux Canal. At 24, Cameron had just been named Wexford's captain in October. He'd been on the lake since he was 14 and his father was a famous lake captain as well. And there is no way he was going to be, uh, appear to be intimidated on his first command by just any storm. The Wexford was built in 1883 for the ocean trade. She'd been on the lake since 1903. It was carrying 50,000 bushels of wheat and was headed for Godridge. Its last trip of the year and many of her crew had already made plans for the winter. What happened to the Wexford, like most of the lost vessels, is, hard, is only conjecture. We do know that she was making good progress towards Godridge on Sunday morning. The storm seemed to have blown itself out. Early that morning, the winds died down to about 15 knots and the barometric pressure began to rise. Captain Stephen of the steamer Chemistiqua reported seeing the Wexford 15 miles off Point Clark in calm waters. Some idea of the speed and violence with which the storm struck Lake Huron can be learned from the testimony of a young guy who was only about 12 at the time, Gordon Jameson, a Point Clark resident, resident who recalled the lake as calm as glass on his way to church that Sunday. By the time church service were, were over, he said, it was obvious that no boat could be safe in that water. As winds gusts of up to 90 miles per hour, 30 foot waves and blizzard conditions swept in from the northeast, the Wexford was taken by what mariners call the White Hurricane. For the Wexford's crew, the vessel must have got maddeningly close to the finding the safety of the Goddard's Harbor. Yet the Wexford's engines became swamped by heavy seas and she lost the struggle against Lake Huron's high winds and blowing snow and heavy waves pulled the Wexford away from safety. Powerless, her engines ceased and the Wexford drifted helplessly at the mercy of the storm where it foundered near St. Joseph's, which is a small French-Canadian settlement south of Bayfield. None of her crew made it to the safety of the nearby shore. At the subsequent inquest, George Ruffle, a Goddard's grain elevator foreman, testified that he had actually seen the Wexford through the blizzard off Goddard's fighting a gale. Others testified that they heard the shriek of her whistle over the sound of the hurricane in a vain attempt to get help from shore. It was lost anyone would hear of the Wexford for 87 years when she was accidentally found off St. Joseph in 75 feet of water on August 25th, 2000 by Donald Chalmers with an inexperienced fish finder. Um, people had spent thousands of dollars trying to comb the lake in, with a side scan and a sonar scan and, and a guy with a fish finder accidentally found it, but anyway. Although Paul Carroll wrote a book on the Wexford, confirms that at least 23 crew members on board the Wexford ships, the Wexford ships owners never knew for sure how many were on board. It, because as one owner said, the ordinary crew on lake freighters are what they call a roving lot. It wasn't uncommon just to hop on board a ship if you were looking for passage. They let you work on board a ship as either an oiler or a coaler, and it's hard to know how many were on any of these ships, which is why numbers of people that drown are, 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 are so wildly different. The youngest on the Wexford was 16-year-old wheelsman Oren Gordon. The oldest were an aged husband and wife, Mr. and Mrs. George Wilmot, who served as the ship's cooks. This was to be their last voyage before retiring to England in December. At least four of the Wexford crew were from Godridge, including cousins Donald and Murdoch MacDonald. Donald's father, Captain Malcolm MacDonald, commanded the lifeboat station at Godridge, and it was to him that the Wexford's last whistleblows were directed. Captain McDonald would lose another son, Roderick, on the steamer Merida in October 1916 on Lake Erie. Another local man, James Glenn, was the nephew of Reverend Mr. Wiley from the Clinton Baptist Church. And according to the Clinton New Era, the 28-year-old Glenn had come to Huron County from Scotland in May 1913. It was to be his last trip on board the Wexford before going home with the intention of returning with his family in the spring. 
Other ships like the John H. McGee, the Regina, the Charles S. Price that went down with all hands on November 9th on Lake Huron can only be mentioned in passing. The Price in particular was a mystery ship because her hull had turned turtle on lower Lake Huron. It took six days for divers to positively identify her hull, but once again she went down with all hands. Yet the most human dimension of the great storm was the recovery of the dead. And it is the cost in lives rather than in hulls and cargoes that the true price of the storm must be measured. If you're from Sarnia, you might, somebody I was talking to at lunch is from Sarnia, you might recognize that there's a famous story. The hog got, got thrown up onto the shore and went through a famous hotel right into the lobby. 529 foot steel monster came, was, was thrown in the lobby by the waves. Gives you some idea of how violent the storm was. On Tuesday, November 11th, after the storm had blown itself out, Robert Turnbull was surveying the damage along the shoreline of his lakefront farm near St. Joseph when he saw a frozen body with outstretched arms, which seemed to be beckoning to him for help. The corpse was the mortal remains of James Glenn, the young Scotsman from the Wexford. For the next week, body, bodies drifted ashore, stiff, bloated, battered, and with their heads capped in ice, wrote Robert Hemmings in Ship Gone Missing. Ships Gone Missing. They wore the life belts bearing the names Wexford, Price, Regina, and the James McGean as they washed up between Thedford and Goderich. In the coming days, at least 53 bodies drifted to the Canadian shore of Lake Huron. Most of the storm's dead never surfaced and are consigned for eternity to the depths of Lake Huron's icy waters. After the storm, all roads leading to the southeast shore of Lake Huron were choked with the wagons of family members both hoping and dreading to discover the fate of their kinfolk. Several bodies were taken to the funeral home in Thedford for the next of kin to identify, and as Fred Landon and Lake Huron wrote, men and women, some dry-eyed, some in tears, gazed intently at the faces which were revealed when the blankets were lifted one by one. Making the problem of, of identification even more difficult was a careless undertaker who tossed the personal belongings of the deceased into one big pile, complicating identification for family members. Milton Smith of Cleveland, an engineer on the price, who left the ship just days before, uh, journeyed to Thedford to assist in the identification of his former crewmates. He positively identified John, John Groundwater, the price's chief engineer. The problem for the coroner was that Groundwater's body was brought in wearing a life jacket from the Regina. Just north of Grand Bend, between Port Blake and St. Joseph's, several seamen from the Regina were recovered. The remains of these sailors, with those of the Wexford, were brought to the Brenner Hotel in Zurich. So many bodies were collected in Zurich that it was reported that they were kept outside for identification. It would be easy to criticize Mr. Brenner for his callousness, but how many innkeepers even today want to store dead bodies for an indefinite period in their hotel. And the uh, cold temperatures outside may have also slowed down decomposition. Coroner Dr. Uh, William Campbell determined that drowning and exposure was the cause of death. One dark episode in the search was that several bodies had their pockets turned inside out, indicating that they had been looted. Matt Campbell in Memories of Godridge noted that a constable accompanied search parties to prevent such occurrences. Other bodies told of maritime chivalry. The body of Emma Walker, the Argus's cook, was found wearing the chief engineer's heavy cloak and the captain's life jacket. Presumably, as the hydrus was sinking, the captain had given Mrs. Walker his life belt and the chief engineer his cloak in the hopes that the only woman aboard would be saved. It was a gallant but futile act. The body of another woman, Mrs. Mary Agnes Heary, the Carruthers cook, was recovered on November 10th, her 39th birthday. She spent it here at Brophy's funeral home in Godridge with the remains of 26 other lost mariners. And if you look at, you can see that's uh, the back of Brophy's funeral home with the life belts. Over here, this is the Godridge Masonic Lodge. Uh, so the tall Italianate building there. Beside it is Brophy's funeral home. And the Goddard's Masonic Lodge, you could see, was just under construction. It was just about two months away from... Uh, that little button is a pointer. Okay. It was just... Uh, the Masonic Lodge in Goddard, which is still a Masonic Lodge in Goddard. It... 
um, was about two or three months away from opening, and it was badly damaged in a great storm in 1913. Brophy's funeral home is right there. This picture was taken in behind Brophy's funeral home, right in behind that building there. Uh, just a little footnote here. In 2011, a tornado went through Goddard, directly hit the Masonic Hall. It almost came down, and in fact, um, it was scheduled to come down, but they decided to rebuild, and it, we, our history of that lodge or that building's kind of been bookended by two great storms, the tornado in 2011 and the great storm in 1913. And what came out of it is the complete and total restoration of our lodge. We're very proud to show it off, and I guess at this point I'd invite anybody that wanted to come up to Goddard. We happened to show off Maitland Lodge. We're very proud of it. But anyway, the strangest tale was that of the body of the mysterious JT. The initials JT tattooed on the forearm of a corpse identified the body as John Thompson of the Carruthers when he was brought to the Brophy Funeral Home on West Street in Goddard. The distraught father traveled from Hamilton and positively identified his son's body. At great expense, Mr. B Thompson bought a bronze casket and shipped the body home for burial. During the wake here in Hamilton in the family parlor, as friends and loved ones grieved, John Thompson, alive and well, walked through the front door. <laughs> Apparently, he had given up his berth on the Carruthers for another ship. When his shocked mother regained consciousness, she quipped, it's just like you to attend your own wake. <laughs> Remains of JT were sent back to Godridge where they are at rest in the Maitland Cemetery with four other unidentified bodies of the great storm. Tragically, John Thompson later drowned in a shipping accident here in Hamilton Harbor in May 1924. A lifeboat with three frozen bodies lashed to it from the Beguine was found near Black's Point by Goddard. Two of these bodies, George Smith and Thomas Stone, were from the Ojibwa Reserve near Sarnia. Their native funeral was attended by hundreds of mourners and was one of the most moving memorial service to the uh, Great Storm's dead. Altogether, at least 253 mariners were lost in the Great Storm. This figure does not include the hundreds of widows and orphans left without support in virtually every port along the Lake Huron shore. The shipping companies paid out a miserly one half year's salary to deceased sailors' family. <coughs> the ship owner's stinginess is in marked contrast with the public generosity, which in Ontario raised over $100,000 in 1913 to compensate the sailors' families. An interdenominational memorial service was held at Knox Presbyterian Church in Goddard on the Sunday following the storm. 1,400 people crammed into the church, including over 400 members of fraternal organizations like the Orange Lodge, the Masons, and the Odd Fellows, who paid their last respects to the lost brethren. Many of the brethren, the four that were lost from Goddard on the Wexford were all Masons and belonged to um, Maitland Lodge number 33. On November 27th, most of the great storm dead had been claimed. A special funeral for the five unknowns attended by hundreds of mourners who doffed hats as the funeral procession wound its way around the Goddard Square, which is what you're seeing there. In Goddard, the five unknown sailors were buried in what the Huron Sable called a sad but impressive spectacle. Their place was marked in the Maitland Cemetery by temporary wooden slabs bearing the names of their ship as stenciled on their life belts. Three slabs were marked Carruthers, one McGean, and the fifth bore the name Kintail, indicating where the body was found. Today, the red granite headstone, inscribed in memory of the unidentified seamen lost in the Great Lakes disaster of November 1913, was erected as their memorial. Unfortunately, I'd like to say that meaningful suggestions came out of the storm and subsequent inquests, but sadly, nothing did. Locally, Goddard upgraded the lighthouse. The, but the great storm was overshadowed by the Great War, leaving the storm all but forgotten except along the lakeshore. Indeed, less than three years later, a less intense storm on Lake Erie in October 1916 sank four vessels with over 50 seamen, uh, once again lost when captains ignored clearly posted gale warnings. For us in Huron County, uh, that day in October 1916 was the most deadly day during the Great War as 10 mariners from Goddard an area drowned on board the steamer Merida. 
Of the 178 seamen known to have been lost on Lake Huron on November 9, 1913, the bodies of fewer than a third were ever recovered. Most of those who searched Lake Huron shores for loved ones, their sad quest was in vain. For these, the depths of Lake Huron is their final resting place until the sea is ready to give up her dead. From that first service in 1913 to the present, Knox Presbyterian Church in Goderich has an annual Mariner's service, which is one of Huron County's oldest traditions, and it's a direct link to the Huron Tracks maritime history. For those of us fortunate enough to live along Lake Huron shores, the lake is an enchanting mistress, but when the gales of November blow, she reminds us that we will never be her master. Thank you. Thank you.